There we go. I want to really welcome everybody to today's session on uh, learning on Python and how to code robots with Python. I hope you enjoyed the session. If you have any questions at any point in time, please feel free to raise your hand. And um, if you have some microphones, please use the chat area. And uh, this recording will be um, published at the end of the week. Then um, over to you, Tanya. Yep, and I believe I'm sharing my screen. Is that correct? There's yes, I can like see. a mess. OK, so let's see. So let's see. So this is where we stopped yesterday or like where we st or started yesterday and stopped. So we looked at kind of like how to do Python on the Lego robots. Today it's EV3 day. And then on Thursday, it'll be uh, Spike Prime Day. And uh, I've worked more with the EV3s than the Spike Primes, but we'll see how it goes. Um, just briefly, what I want to go over today is our uh, basic programming concepts. Because uh, why are we programming the robots or why are we using the robot? We have kind of some problem that we'd like to see solved and uh, the program is attempting to do that for us and after that all i plan to do is just kind of like show you example after example after example in most cases the robot is not going to move i'm tired of motion we spend a lot of time just kind of like telling the robot to go forward go turn left go backwards and so forth so this time we're making it do other stuff um but let's see up. We've seen all this yesterday. Let me quickly fast forward. OK, here's where I want to start. So in principle, what we call sequential programming is just kind of like our program starts on the top and it goes line by line. And uh, yeah, the first line is executed, then the next line is executed, then the next line is executed um, until we reach the bottom of the program and then the program is over. So um, that's what we call sequential programming. That's kind of like the really easiest part uh, to program. And that's where my first example will start. Um, but there are other cases. There is what we call selection, where we're doing different things in different cases. Uh, one of the examples could be, I have my touch sensor here, and when I press it, I want the robot to stop, and if it's not pressed, I want the robot to move forward. Things like that. So there are like different cases of selection. Simple selection is one or two cases. Um, if the touch sensor is pressed, do something. And if it was not pressed, then we're not doing anything. So that's kind of like a single case, or we have two different scenarios. Do one thing when the touch sensor is pressed, and do another thing when the touch sensor isn't pressed. So that's an easy, like what we call a simple selection or an if else statement. We can also have like multiple, more than two cases. Um, so those more than two cases, how could that look like? I could use the ultrasonic sensor. And I could again decide kind of like if, well, let's say it points to the front and the robot is moving forward. And I could say like if the distance it measures, let's put it really close, if the distance is less than 10 centimeters, I want the robot to stop. Else if the distance is between 10 and 20 centimeters, I want the robot to slow down. And in the last case, maybe like the distance is more than 20 centimeters or kind of like, yeah, greater than 20 centimeters, then I just keep still want the robot to go forward full speed. So that's kind of like the idea, do different things in different scenarios. And that's what we call selection or if, else, if, uh, else statements. Um, and they do have a graphical representation something if you're not familiar with it so like well these slides they have come like on the left a little bit of python statement how to do this in python and on the right side they have what's called a flow chart 
and I really would come like for planning purposes, how to write your programs. It's good to have kind of like uh, students or yourself think about a flowchart. Uh, we always have conditions. Conditions are questions you can answer with yes, no, or true, false. Those are the only kind of answers a computer can handle or questions it can handle. So we can kind of like set up is distance less than 20 centimeters. Um, true, stop, false, nothing. That's an if statement. Here we can ask the same question. Is the distance less than 20 centimeters? True, yeah. Um, stop, false, keep going. So different, different things that we do in different cases. And here we would have kind of like the three different scenarios. Less than 10 centimeters could be this condition, stop immediately between 10 and 20 centimeters. Uh, could be this condition, slow down and false could have like otherwise just keep going. So that's what we call selection and if else statements, the important thing. So we do different things in different scenarios, but we only ask this question once. We come from the top on these flow charts and uh, our, our questions, our selections or conditions are always in these rumble shapes. And then we keep going uh, with all the connect, all the stuff at the end again. Um, another option that we have is to repeat stuff. Um, have certain tasks that get repeated over and over again. Um, I said we don't do motion, but motion is a good one. Uh, one of the things. Um, or one of the tasks I give learners often when they are brand new to robotics is kind of like make your robot go in a square. So going in a square basically means move straight forward for a given distance, turn 90 degrees, and then repeat those two actions, move forward and turn four times. So it's kind of like we don't need to copy and paste and drag and drop the same uh, code and make it longer. And then like if the turn was slightly off, we need to fix it at each position. But we can have lines of code that get executed several times. And that's what we call a loop or a repetition statement. In order to do that, there are certain things that we need to know. We need to know what we want to repeat. Go straight turn. We need to know. Uh, yeah, how often we want to do it. We need to know how often we've already done it such that we can decide is the time to stop or do we how often do we still need to do it? And we also need to know once we're done, what do we want to do next? Um, easy loops are loops where we know exactly how often we want to execute the repetition as in go around the square once. Uh, yeah, go forward and turn. We do that four times. So it's kind of like countable. We can count where are we. And uh, this looping variable is the one that would take care of the counting. And in sequence, it's kind of like, yeah, do it one, two, three, four times. And the code block would just be the go forward, turn, and then come back to the top, hold track where we were, go forward, turn again, and go back. So we can reuse the same line of code, kind of like from the bottom, go to a place further up in the program. Um, it's a little trickier with while loops. Uh, while loops are used generally when we don't know for how long uh, something is true or how often we want to repeat a certain um, action. So again, I could use my sensor and I could say while the distance it's measuring is greater than tw uh, 20 centimeters, keep going forward. And it keeps kind of like measuring and the moment that condition becomes false, then the statements will no longer be executed. The difference between like so the while loop, like while a condition is true, it has a condition the same way as an if else if statement, but it kind of like re-evaluates the condition again and again. It executes the statement and then goes back to the top and then it executes the statement. It checks is the condition still true. OK, do it again, do it over and over again and then stop. Um, and that's oftentimes the case with kind of like some while the touch sensor isn't pressed or while it is pressed as in if it is pressed, then we only check that once and we're not going back to checking it over again. OK, so those are kind of like the different concepts we're going to look through today. And now we're going to look at programs uh, and at example programs. 
So let me, I've opened my first one. We need to increase the font size. Um, remember, we have in Visual Studio Code, we have, if we go here to the Lego icon, we can open the user guide and then we can have the user guide on the site. And how do we know what, uh, how the com comments or like how, what the instructions do? Well, you just got to read and read it up in the user site. It's always, I don't uh, program this often enough to know it by heart. So, oops, it's here. This is what I want. So. My first example um, is called, and I think I can make this one larger, it's called speaker output. I did tell you I don't want to do too much motion. Last time we have seen how we would uh, create a new project from this Lego button and then create new project. And there were like, the, the, uh, the it wasn't an empty window that showed up, but it was pre-populated. And it had kind of like from PyBricks, it had this like hubs from where we import the EV3 bricks. So that's kind of like the object oriented class or kind of like library that makes us understand how the brick works. And then in this example, so I'm going to use the speaker. So eventually I'm also going to use a sound file. And I'm also using from the tools because I'd like to have like a little pause in between one and the next action. Um, task is sequential programming. So we're starting on the top and we work our way through. Um, and we're going to make this robot speak. So um, what is the portion we need? We actually don't need wheels. We don't need a motor. All we need is the brick. It needs to be switched on. My uh, EV3 brick is connected to uh, my computer. I still need to kind of like connect the software to my computer. And I can go down. So I went on this top icon and then on the bottom, it says click here to connect the device. Same as last time, connecting my device. Um, you see there's a yellow icon that or yellow circle that turns into a green circle. Once we have the green circle, the connection has been established. And we also see kind of like I can click and get information about uh, my EV3 device. So it tells me something about the voltage of the battery and then it has kind of it has that home robot directory. And what's in there are kind of like all the programs that have been downloaded onto my little SD micro SD card uh, in the past. So they are all kind of like stored on the um, micro SD card such that the same as with the other types of software, we can run the program from the robot itself and we don't need to keep that connection to the computer. OK, so robot is connected. Um, We've heard it beep last time. So that's kind of like this portion in line 16. So here it's not Tanya's EV3. This time it's just called EV3. And this EV3 is of type EV3 brick. So that's the class it belongs to. And the class doesn't need to know anything. It knows everything by itself. So we, but we do need the empty brackets. And then with this dot notation, my EV3 brick has a speaker. So that's dot speaker. So it's a portion or a functionality of the brick and it beeps. And when I have empty parameters or like empty brackets here, it just beeps. And I've decided I wanted to wait for a thousand. So what does wait for a thousand mean? Well, I looked it up in, kind of, uh, in tools here because it came out of tools out of the user manual and time, like the wait time is measured in milliseconds. So a thousand milliseconds is one second. So when I say wait a thousand, it's just kind of like waiting between this beep and what it does afterwards in line 20 for one second. Okay, so when I use the empty brackets, then it takes the default values but I can also go and check what my EV3 speakers can do. So I can go kind of like here to the hub, programmable hubs. 
using the buttons? No, we're not using the buttons right now. We're using the speaker. So this entire section here on using the speaker tells you how to use the speaker and what, what somebody has already programmed for us to make our life easy. So the speaker has certain functionalities. So those go again with dot and then the functionality. So it can beep. If I don't say anything, it beeps by its default value and otherwise, but I can specify the frequency at which it beeps. And I can also specify for how long I want it to beep. And again, this duration is in milliseconds. So when it says 100, it means, uh, yeah, 0.1 second, beep for 1.2 second. So what I have here in this one is, so this is just kind of like working with default values, don't specify anything, or working with uh, specified values. So I've decided I wanted a frequency of a thousand. If you know a little bit of physics, you know like frequency is measured in hertz, a thousand hertz. So a thousand oscillations per second, and I want it to beep for an entire second, and then I want it to wait again. And that's really all this does. So let's see, I'm not sure, like, uh, I'll hold it really close to uh, wherever my microphone is on this computer. But if, how do we run the program? We have to go here to run and debug, and then I can run it. Oops. There's still stuff in there I didn't want to. So I hope you heard the short beep. That was the default beep. Kind of like from here. And then the beep, the longer beep, where I have specified the frequency or the pitch and the duration. And I can change the pitch. I can make it lower frequency make it 500 hertz, save my program, run it again. And you see like there's something in there where it downloads some. And the pitch was a lower pitch now. So that's just kind of like giving you some ideas of um, what somebody has already kind of like done for us. I have a few other things, um, and if you cannot hear the sound at all, you need to interrupt me now and we move on to something else. But when looking through using the speaker, I've seen it can beep. I've also seen it can play notes. So those of you who know about uh, musical notation and notes, um, we can actually specify what notes we want the um, the robot to play. So we would use, um, you see it here like in red, like in square brackets, we can, uh, we put the individual notes. So we have like square brackets and then uh, we have the list of notes separated by a comma and each of these notes needs to be in single quotes or double quotes. That just means it's kind of like it's text that it's interpreting. So what, um, so it like the C4 divided by four, it's a quarter note played uh, at the pitch of C4 on the piano keyboard. So we can actually make our robot play notes. And um, I have like a cut and paste here a little. So if I wanted to play a few notes, I can copy this back in and I'm going to comment out my beep and my wait because otherwise it'll all be too long. So hashtag just comment it out. It's not, it's still there. You can reactivate it afterwards. And now, so now it can play notes and it would play like uh, two different C notes um, at, in, at a given tempo. And if we run it, then I'm not sure. Let me let me quickly see. I don't think this. No, this doesn't work. So I always have to, but I can make this up. We don't need to waste that much space. Okay, so it has played. I, I 
honestly only ah uh, yeah i honestly only heard one note that's because there weren't any they weren't separated so let's try this again let's take the file download it Yeah, so the two, two peeps you heard was like a C3 and then an, an octave higher a C4 uh, note being played. Um, I did kind of like an exercise where I took like musical notation and I copied kind of, uh, I copied, I'll show you in a moment, I copied like an entire song you can use. So this is like a German children's song um, that for which I looked up the notes. So it's kind of like if you can play it with one finger on the piano, um, one finger at a time, then the robot can play it and it would play an entire song. And you see like the different notes, C4, D4, E4, like the quarter notes here. And then this one is twice as long, but you can play entire songs. Have your robot do something fun. So again, it's something, it's a capability. It's a method of the speaker and the speaker is part of the EV3 brick, so ev3.speaker.playnotes. And then in square brackets, the list of all the notes you want to play and how long you want them to be. Um, something else that really impressed me on this sequential programming, I'm not going to play the song to you, is speaker.say. The robot can actually talk and on despite the micro SD card being such a small device, um, it can store enough information to where we can enter text and the robot would speak that text. So it's a text to voice translation. Um, let me you just copy. OK, and you guys need to I need your help at the moment. I made it. I made this up, uh, this conversation. So and it reminded me it's something that reminded me of being in South Africa. So somebody would kind of like approach me and say something in Afrikaans and I'm just kind of like, sorry, I don't speak it. I speak German and English and French and then kind of like have it to speak in different languages. So what we're going to do in this exercise here is basically we have a conversation between person one and person two, where person where one person one to say something in Afrikaans and then person two to answer in English. And then person one says something in German and person two answers in German. So I, fe I felt like that was pretty cool. So it's kind of like, so the EV3 speaker say just needs text and it'll speak it out. If we don't specify um, a language, then the default language for the EV3 is English, but we can specify there's a list again, like in the user manual, there's an entire list of kind of like what languages does it speak. Uh, so it does speak Afrikaans, it speaks US English, British English, Australian English, it speaks German, it speaks French, it speaks Spanish, um, lots of European languages. So, the EV3 doesn't speak any native African languages, unfortunately. Um, so we're not going to listen to the song, but the point I'm trying to make is kind of like, well, it goes from top to bottom and uh, somebody has already done a lot of work for us such that we can just enter text and um, it'll convert the text into the language. And it's really funny if you set the wrong language and it tries to pronounce it in kind of like, it pronounce German in English uh, or some uh, other things. So before we can say something, if we don't want to speak English for the speaker, we need to set the speech options. That's something you only need to do once unless you keep changing it. And there you can change uh, set the language. You can, there are different voices. They are like male and female voices. And um, you can specify the speed. Do you want to speed it up or not? And you can specify the pitch as in, yeah, the, the pitch of the voice. Um, so that's, that's kind of like that portion. And 
you listen to it in a moment. And then the other thing I wanted to show you is to play. Play a, a, a sound file. And we're going to copy and paste this in because somehow. Yeah, so we can also kind of like, well, we can set the volume for whatever we're doing and we can play a sound file. So I found like uh, the Star Wars. Uh, 60 seconds of the Star Wars file. So just the, whatever wave file that you find on the Internet, the robot can play it. So we're going to hear kind of like just it's made very easy here a conversation and then hear the robot kind of like play a sound that was. Uh, yeah, entered into uh, the library. Um, and it would play it and we're not going to play this one. OK. I'm not sure. Ah, here's the music. And we'll keep going. Until I stop it the way you always stop it, kind of like press use the back button and we can stop what's going on. So that's to just come like something different that the EV3 can do in Python that's easy to implement. Um, what have we seen to recap? Um, we have seen that we can generally use default settings uh, or we can provide our own settings. We can beep, we can play notes. We can also convert text to voice. And I'm not sure how well you were able to hear it. It sounds very synthetic, these male and female voices that uh, it generates. So synthetic speech, but we can just enter text and it'll play it. And all these um, commands were executed one after the other until we reached the end. And at the end, there were like 60 seconds of the Star Wars uh, um, yeah, theme that I then decided not to make you listen to till the very end. OK, so that's kind of like sequential programming and playing with voice. And what did and what inspired me to do so was really kind of like browsing through um, the user manual, kind of like the hub. And I didn't feel that much like the buttons, but I felt like let's let's just play with the speaker. You can also play with the display, of course, you can um use the screen as in you can write messages to the screen you can show picked images of the screen on the screen you can draw lines or make it a graphing calculator whatever you want to but you can also use the screen i just feel like my eyes are getting too old for that tiny screen so well i uh decided not to use that portion okay so maybe before we move on to the next uh, example, any questions? Silence. OK, so my next example. Is actually about repetition. It's about making the robot do. Um, uh, reuse the same line of code again and again. And what it is, it's a countdown. So we're basically having the robot countdown 10, 9, 8, up to 1. And then it'll say ignition. So as if it was a rocket and uh, be off on its way to space. Um, again, I don't need, 
I don't need models. So from like the libraries and the classes that we're importing, um, I only kept the ones that I'm I need. I need my hub. I still need my weight block because I don't I want it. I don't want it to do. I want it to wait in between because I'm so slow. And I needed kind of like from parameters color because I also decided like as it counts down, I want the LED lights to blink kind of like 10, 9, 8 and so forth. So I wanted to have kind of like red flashing LED lights. Um, yeah, and go ahead. So it will talk again. It will also kind of like print on the screen and it will flash the lights and yep that's what it does there now countdown from 10 to 0 is easy enough to where i could just kind of like take a line of code we know how to make the robot go and say something i could take well and i can get rid of the beep but i could take a line of code copy it 10 times and i could just kind of like here Enter the numbers. You get the idea. Not going here. Let's be done here. So I could kind of like enter the numbers and it would do the same with the countdown, maybe put a weight in between it that it doesn't speak too fast. But if afterwards I say, let's make it a countdown that goes from 100 down to one, it really gets too tedious to uh, create these 100 lines or maybe, yeah. Um, so therefore we want to just kind of like automate the countdown process. And we're going to do that with a loop or a repetition statement. This one is a for loop. And here, we see what a repetition looks like. So a for loop, remember, is the loop where we know how often we want to do it. We want to do it 10 times. So it starts with the word for, and then it needs the name of a variable. So it needs a name that holds track of where we are in our countdown. And then we need to tell it in which range we want that variable to be. So then uh, the, the syntax here, and this is kind of like a primitive Python uh, that works just, uh, that's nothing specific to robotics, is that we want our countdown. So this is the start value, start at 10, stop at zero. And for some reason in Python, like the start value is always included and the stop value is not included. So it stops before it reaches zero um, and then countdown in steps of negative one. I can also tell it to make it a countdown going in steps of negative two, like 10, eight, six, four, two, but we go in steps of negative one. Okay, so this is really like typical Python and then you need a colon as in here the loop starts. And after that, what is important, you see like all these statements here, they have been shifted to the right or indented, as in you use the tap on the keyboard and press the tap once. And that tells Python that everything that is kind of like shifted to the right by one tap is inside the loop. So all these like from line uh, 15 to line 20, we don't need line 21, all that is executed in the loop. So when we start our loop, count gets the first value here. So count gets a value of 10. And then we're going to print the number 10 on the, um, on this. Yeah, we're going to print it, but we're not going to print it down here. If I, I can print it in my output put window. I'm going to do that in addition. So I'll move this here. So I'm going to print it to where you will be able to see it on the bottom of the window here. But then we're also going to print it. Well, we get the idea. EV3 brain screen print. So EV3.screen.print and then count. So that will print the numbers on the display. You won't be able to see it. I can just kind of like you got to trust me on that. It'll say the numbers. So it'll speak, so the speaker will say the numbers. Now the problem is that these are numbers and the speaker can only say text. 
So what we need to hear what's like this portion is take the number 10, like as in the number 10 and write it out as in T E N, make it string like the letter uh, or like, yeah, like the characters that say 10, but with which I cannot perform any additional multiplication. OK, next I'm switching the light on. So my EV3 has lights and I want them on and I specify the color in which I want them on. I wait for half a second and then EV3.light.off. I'm switching them off again and switching the lights off. We don't need to specify any parameters. Off is off. And then we're waiting again for uh, half a second and once so and then we're going back to the top and then count is decreased by one. So next we do everything with the number nine. Print number nine, say uh, print number nine on the screen, say number nine, flash the lights, go back up to the top, decrease it by one more. So then we're at eight and keep going. And then eventually after we've done it for count being number one, then we'll go and check and we finished because like we stopped before we reach zero and then we execute whatever else comes after the loop so this portion here is all the way to the left again and <coughs> it will be executed after the loop is over okay um it's very easy to make mistakes with these four loops if I just forget to indent stuff. As in, if I do it this way, then the for loop only executes the first three lines of code and the flashing of the LEDs, uh, like the light on and off, that will only happen after it's done with counting. So it's not like these empty lines tell it when um, the for loop is over, but what's inside the for loop, what we want to repeat needs to be shifted to the right by one tap on your keyboard. So, hey little robot, let's see. I've opened a new program. Whenever I open a new program, I need to reconnect my robot. Just something and then I need to go back and I can play it. And I hope you hear it OK. And once the green lights turn on again, the program is over. So what you see, well, I'm, I'll, I'll watch the recording at some point, and I'm sure you couldn't see the numbers on the screen, but you also saw like the numbers being printed out here. That was my first print statement here in line 15. So they had print out the numbers on the screen. Uh, that portion only works while you have your robot connected to the computer uh, via USB cord. Um, you cannot expect it to print on like on my output, standard output uh, window here if it's not connected to it. So this, once you want to disconnect your robot up, you need to put it there. So that's a very easy way of uh, kind of like writing a loop. So you get the idea if your loop was about going in a square, you would have one statement for the motors to go straight. You would have another statement for the motors to turn a right angle, left or right, depending on which way you want to go around the square. And then you would basically repeat everything four times. So you would come like either here count from one to four or you count from zero to three or you can count down, doesn't matter in which way you count. It just matters that you do it four times, or if you need to go around the square, you do it eight times. Okay. 
So that was the second example. That was an example of a loop. And then let's look at the next one. So remember, you go file, open folder, and ah, example three is on selection. And example three um, has um, an if statement. So selections were if statements in order for example three to work. I need my touch sensor connected. So we, we add a little onto it here now. So what's new in this program? Well, again, I need to specify my object EV3. Yes, I do have an EV3 brick. So I named it EV3. I also need to tell the program that I now have a touch sensor. So you Hello, see Tanya. up here. Tanya. Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh yeah, I thought I saw somewhere on the last program um, that you actually coded a string. And I thought strings were always um, inside quotation marks, but yours was inside brackets. Does not does that not give you an error? Thank you. OK, so that one I'll get back to that in a moment. That one was that was the music we were playing. Let me just. Uh, this is way too small. Um, what it was, it, it was a sequence of strings. So it was an array of strings. So what happened is I had square brackets and then each of the strings was in uh, quotes to specify it as a string. So it's kind of like I had this string and then I had this string. So it's kind of like a sequence of strings that it automatically knew uh, to play one after the other. That's why uh, those that didn't give me an error, but I had to have like quotes for each of the strings. OK, back to our touch sensor. So I need to, I now have, I need to now import the EV, the, uh, the class EV3 devices, kind of like all the stuff I can connect to my EV3 brick as in the sensor, so we don't have motors yet. And uh, from all the devices, the only one I need in this example is the touch sensor. So I'm just importing the touch sensor. And I don't think, uh, I'm not sure if I need these brackets. I think I just copy, uh, you copy and paste it and delete it. I still have my wait block because I'm waiting for one second down here. Um, I use the media EV3, me, uh, the media files that exist uh, for EV3 dev, and I'm importing image files. What that one does is I want to show kind of like an image on the screen, and I therefore I need to import the image files. So here, well, Define your EV3 brick, the object, define the object touch sensor, and tell the program to which port you're going to connect the touch sensor. So when I'm defining my EV3 brick of, or like my EV3 here as class EV3 brick, I don't need to specify any input parameters because there's nothing to specify with my touch sensor. And remember here on the left, I can name it whatever way I want to. Here, I have to write it exactly the way as it shows up here, the way the class is defined. Well, I need to tell the program to which port I'm going to connect my touch sensor. So I'm going to take my touch sensor and connect it to port one, just because it says so there. So now I have a touch sensor in addition to my EV3 brick. Um, I kind of kept beep here that's like okay the program is ready to do something and then i have a wait block of four seconds because i want to have some time to decide whether i press the touch sensor or not now the touch sensor again how do i know what to do with the touch sensor i go back to the user manual and i look at ev3 devices and then we have the motors first. 
and we keep and here and I shouldn't like the scrolling is always a question by itself question of but here's the touch sensor. So it tells you like there's the class touch sensor and it needs the input like which port it is um, connected to and it has one method that is pressed with so you call it touch sensor dot pressed no input parameters so empty brackets and that one returns true or false depending on whether it is pressed or not so we can check if touch sensor my touch sensor here is pressed I want my EV3 to say something, so it'll say touch sensor was pressed and it'll show an image like a stop sign on the screen. And then it waits for a second and then it'll say and then it's done with this if statement. So if the touch sensor wasn't pressed when the code reaches line 19, it will jump over this entire block and it'll go directly to line 24 and it'll just say goodbye okay so let's see um well what else so the notation was we need the word if and you see like these always show up in different colors and then we need a condition something that is either true or false and this touch sensor pressed returns to us the state of the touch sensor and that one is yeah provides a true or false, true when it's pressed, false when it's not pressed. OK, so once again, let's connect to the EV3. And let's run the program and remember like between between the beep and when it evaluates uh, whether the touch sensor is pressed, they are like four seconds. That's why I have this wait block. But um, yeah, so let me download the program. Download it. Exited with error code. Ah, doesn't work. Okay, it says exited with error code one. And it says name port isn't defined. Which means it doesn't understand this. Which means I didn't import everything I needed. So now I need to go back and figure out what I forgot to import. Easiest way is I quickly look at my example file where I imported everything. Um, that was yesterday. That was the demo project. Up and where does it say here? From Prybricks parameters import port. That's the portion I forgot to add here. Let's see, hopefully it works now. Actually, I wanted to show you an error message. Um, so when your program doesn't run successfully, as in most of the time, um, in this output window or terminal, it shows you the error message and you need to read it carefully and you need to kind of like figure out what it means. It, they, it tries really well to give you an idea of where the issue is, but it's not always kind of like hinting us in the right direction. Um, but here it was pretty good. It said in line 13 in module, well, name port isn't defined. So if I go to line 13, well, and now this is line 13, but I've added already a line. So when it created the error message, I had not imported line four. So line 13 was this one. So it tells us in which line we need to look and it tells us, OK, port here doesn't know. And since I know it's supposed to work, 
and it's not like uh, well, it could give me another error message as if I connected to port S2 instead of port S1, then the error message would be a different one, but it said port wasn't defined. So that well, that hinted me to, well, I still need to import the port and here is like my import port. So let's see if it works now. Uh, I've saved it, yes. Beep. Not fine. And then it said goodbye. So I didn't press the touch sensor, so it beeped. Where's the beep here? Line 17, it beeped. It waited for four seconds, then it checked if the touch sensor was pressed after the four seconds were over. I didn't press it and it said goodbye. So if I download it again and this time keep the touch sensor pressed, It talked, it talked to me, it said touch sensor was pressed. It showed a stop sign on the screen. And then when it was done, it waited for a second and then it said goodbye. So it either executes these three lines of code or it jumps over them and goes directly to line 25, basically depending on whether this condition is true or false. Now I can say, I can say, well, if it wasn't pressed, then I also want to do something. Since we can see the screen, let's just do the talking. So I can say else, and then I copied, and you see it didn't get the indent right. So I need to adjust this. I can say touch sensor was not pressed. So now I have two cases. If at the point where the program reaches line 20, the touch sensor is pressed, it'll say touch sensor was pressed. And if that was not the case, it'll jump over all these lines in the if block and it'll go to the else and it will say touch sensor was not pressed. And then it's done with the else and then it'll say goodbye, which it says all the time, regardless of what I do with the touch sensor. So if we run this, let me not press it. So it did talk, oh it did tell me it was not pressed and then it said goodbye. So that's a basic selection with an if. Here's the condition that needs to be true and an else. And the else is whenever, well, it, the else doesn't ask questions. It's else otherwise. So you don't need a condition after the else. It's just come like if this was false, it will do this. If this was true, it'll do this and it'll jump over the else and go to the end. OK, so those were my selections. Um, what do we want to do next? We have four minutes left. Are there any questions? No, everybody's silent. Uh, I don't see anything on the chat. Um, I'll give you one more example. Well, and then maybe maybe what I need to do is I need to kind of like zip. Kaspar, how do I best share everything? Shall I zip the ISET folder and put it into the chat right now? If you can put it into the chat, that will be helpful. Otherwise, you can maybe send it to me and I will uh, create a folder, a OneDrive folder for you. OK, let's see. Yeah. So I'll do both normally. Where's com here? Compress. I can compress ISET. Now I have ISET in a compressed format, and I should be able to take the ISET.zip. And it's coming in the chat. So that one has all the examples on the EV3s that I have. Uh, 
presented today, it has a little bit more. Um, it no guarantee that all of them work. But um, so it has the speaker output, it has the countdown, it has the touch selection, it has the selection based on distance. Um, it has a little bit of motor motion and it has a while loop as in we use a while loop for uh, while, while the distance is greater than a threshold, keep going, otherwise stop. So there's a little bit of motion in there too. Um, I think I've sent you actually a lot of many of my prototype files too. So inside I set inside the EV3 folder where it says example one through example six, those are the ones I'm actually, uh, yeah, I've actually prepared particularly for this, uh, for this uh, meeting and no guarantee that they all work. But that's kind of like a little bit of like what programs look like. I like the color coding. Uh, and I guess I can sh stop sharing like kind of like, yeah. And I like I like that I can always look up stuff in the user manual on the site, which is in uh, a browser window and explore from there, copy and paste from there and uh, make sure I'm doing what I want to do and get some new ideas. Most of the time, so most struggles come with either not looking at the error message or not understanding the error message. And sometimes the error messages are a little awkward. And some other struggles come from, I don't really know what I want to do, but let me write code anyways. I see well, Eric, there's the a question. Sometimes is very funny with Python, I know. But uh, you just have to send it into the chat area and then over to you, Eric. Uh, thanks, um, thanks, Tanya. That was very interesting. I learned a lot of new things. Um, I don't see your zip file yet. Do do you need? I don't know the teams. Do you need to push the um, the paper plane button or just press the same button? I think. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's see. Yeah. So it had to. Yeah. Here now it's on its okay. way. I see it. Yeah. Now. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It took a little moment for it to to upload, and then yeah, I did forget to press that little okay. paper plane icon. That That's happens okay. to me I'll with my students Thank often. My... Okay. Good. So that one has like all the stuff and more, but those it's kind of like I believe in. I do believe in like learning from examples, like learning from templates, but uh, even more. I feel like make sure you switch on your brains, like your own brains, not the brain and uh, make an effort to understand what it's doing. Play with like with the hashtag, you can always comment out stuff and come like, let me see what this line does. Let me see what that line does and then make changes to it to where it would uh, yeah, make adjustments to where it does what you want it to do. And I did share my email yesterday, which was nice because come like I did get emails. I'll put it in here. here. It comes one more time. If somebody wants to send me something by email, um, love to hear from you. Love to hear suggestions. So, yeah, and we'll provide answers. Although today, so today was my teaching day. Today I taught like two hours in the morning, two hours right before coming. So my brain is kind of fried, but give it a little patience. But I do answer my emails. And then, on Thursday, we'll do similar things. I'm not sure if the Spike Prime speaks. I haven't made it speak that much, but we can. We have those LED, like the LED matrix or like the light matrix, so we can show different pictures on the light matrix. And again, like do something on selection, like if elif else um, or use a loop. The um, most of those commands are very similar where like the classes that are predefined for us differ between the EV3s and uh, the spike primes is on motion and motors, particularly for the robotics application and the drive base. Um, they did a better job on the EV3s than they did on, uh, on the spike prime, I feel, um, but the whole like motion and how to make a turn without just sit, uh, using a slider that's kind of like a session by itself. So maybe we can meet some other week and talk about those things.
And that's really everything I have for today. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Okay, yes, Eric. I've just got a comment uh, on Spike Prime. Uh, they, um, they can be beeps uh, on the hub when that's all. Any of the sounds okay. actually actually come from your device, which is not ideal. So maybe that'll give you a bit of a heads uh, up when you code, try and code that. Yeah, and I hadn't seen like I browsed through the Spike Prime. Uh, yeah, getting starting and knowledge base as they call it, and I didn't see anything particularly not on the text to vo uh, to speech translation, which I found I found that for like just a, such a little device pretty impressive that it can read texts and kind of like speak it out or lo know how to read that it has learned to read actually in many languages. So that's something also like with the display for sure, like that doesn't uh, exist on the Spike Prime. But I do have a couple of good examples there too, because uh, last semester I took my my students here from Namibia University of Science and Technology to the Minds and Action Steam Center where I was sitting yesterday and they had to do well, they, they learned Python in my class, or they were supposed to. I'm not sure how successful I was, uh, but uh, it was a type of class on Python programming, and I thought like, okay, it's time to do some fun. It's time to see programming in action. So we used the spike primes and made the robot do things, and uh, it was it was a success. They enjoyed doing that. Yeah, you can use the the light matrix to display kind of messages and things like that. But yeah, I. I haven't yeah. seen that text to speech before, so that that was quite impressive. Um, but I don't think the Spike Prime can do that. I don't think I don't think so either. OK, then. Any other questions? So let me see. Somebody's give me like two more minutes. I'm finishing up something. But then I want to. Nobody. I only want to say, OK, thank you, Carmen. <laughs> yeah, I see is thank you so much, Tanya, for everything. Thank you so much for everybody for joining us. Pl uh, please enjoy the rest of your day and please enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.